Good morning, everyone, and uh, good to see, good to be together on this beautiful, bright and crisp, cold uh, spring morning. It's three degrees here in, uh, in in Epsom, and I think that's even colder than in Lanark. There you go, sort of turn up. Uh, we're in John's Gospel, chapter eight, and last time we looked at the. Um, the fourth water pot it was the woman taken in adultery and we saw how the lord ministered to her a great need because she was of course in a in a terrible sin um and uh, the lord ministered to her and if you remember we finished last time by telling the story of james and uh, what was it james and henry and we talked about the way that the debt of Henry was paid, uh, sorry, well, let me get the right names. Uh, let me confuse you all with names. Turn to my story. Um, we talked about the fact that um, Henry went to university, that's right, and studied law. James uh, was an investor and a developer, and he, got into all kinds of a mess and eventually he was sent to the court where his friend uh, his friend <clears throat> Henry was the judge and we looked at the way Henry both was a friend to James and loved him as a brother but he was also a judge and applied the full rigor of the law but then paid that debt himself and that's the explanation for the riddle that the Pharisees posed in this chapter to Jesus. That riddle is going to be uh, further explored in this chapter because, of course, the other Jesus himself put a, a riddle back to them when he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And they were convicted by their own conscience and all went out. So we're going to see in this chapter, two big themes as we read down the chapter. The first great theme is the, the identity of Christ, the identity of Jesus Christ. And the second great theme is going to be the true nature of sin and how Jesus can set people free from the power of sin. So we're looking first then, as we read down at the identity of Jesus. And this chapter has some of the most remarkable statements about Jesus Christ in the Bible. Let's read from verse chapter 8, verse 13. Jesus had said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then in verse 13, the Pharisees have obviously come back. Remember, they left. Uh, the crowd was still there who was listening to Jesus teach, but the Pharisees had brought the woman. They had now left, and now they come back again in verse 13. So sometime later, we're not sure how long. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. And this is one of those verses where, which is quite common in, in the book of uh, John, that Jesus expresses his knowledge of pre-existence. Jesus did not begin life when he was born in Bethlehem. He came from the glory. And you, this is a theme going through the Gospel of John. And it's expressed in that verse, I know where I came from. And in chapter 17, he says that the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world. And you get all these, this, these, these verses, these statements, I am from above. This knowledge of pre-existence, he, he is the eternal son who came down from heaven. And that's the identity of Christ, that he is 
expressing here. But he also says, I know where I'm going. And the theme is going to be developed as he goes through right into chapter, uh, into the upper room in chapter 13, 14, and so on, the, those chapters that cover the teaching in the upper room. He's, he speaks of, I know where I'm going. And where's he going? He's going back to heaven. But the great thing is he's going to the Father. Now, it's also clear that he has to go back via the cross. But Jesus doesn't see the cross as his final destination. He's passing through the cross, through death and resurrection and back to the Father. Uh, and so Jesus has this constant theme in mind. I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. I am. And of course, this is uh, something that we can learn from because we're not the eternal son, but we do know where we're going. We have our eyes not on the uh, immediate destinations in front of us, but on the eternal destination. We are on a journey back to God. We go to God now in spirit and in prayer and in knowing him. And our final destination is God. And uh, when we think of the different staging posts on that journey, there may be sickness involved, there may be death. Well, there will be death probably for all of us. But through, those are not the, they're just passing through points. Now, the cross was a horrible place for Christ because it was not just death and not just any death, not just any suffering. It was a unique suffering. And we are not ever going to see such suffering because we follow him. He bore that suffering for us. But he himself saw that as a passing through point. And he said, I am going to the Father. That was his eyes were always on the Father. Then in verse 15, he said, you judge according to the flesh. You judge with natural light. He's talking to the Jews, he's, uh, the Pharisees. You, you make judgments, you make value judgments according to natural light, the flesh. And that's what he means by the flesh here. Uh, the flesh, we've already mentioned this in other times, that the flesh has a wide meaning from sinful nature to natural light, natural powers. And here he's referring to the natural light. We are not to judge things by natural light and then jesus says i judge no one of course he's referring there to his um his attitude of being not critical from himself he's not a critical person i judge no one yet if i do have judgments he says my judgment is is true for i am not alone but i am with the father who sent me so he's taking his light, his discernment, not from any uh, understanding that is natural, but from his fellowship with the Father. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bear witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. We've remarked on this several occasions already that Jesus was saying there are two witnesses, me and God. <laughs> and if I said to you this morning, I'm right because God and I agree, <laughs> that's two people, you would say, no, that's one person, that's you, Les, and you, your knowledge of God, that's you, still you. But that is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I witness to you, and the Father is also witnessing to you, independent of me. This is confirmed in various scriptures. For example, um, uh, it, Jesus said in um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, he said to when Peter said, you are the Messiah, Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he's speaking of the activity of the Father. 
to reveal who Jesus is. And then he also said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, he said, no one knows the Son but the Father, and no one knows the Father but the, the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him, and so on. There's this necessity of the revelation. Um, let me read the verse. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So he's saying that there is, there is a twofold witness. There's Christ standing before us through his word. Um, through the scriptures, through the things we understand, there's Christ standing before us. But there's also the activity of the Father in our hearts, revealing Jesus to us and confirming. So we have this inner witness, this, we, we spoke of it as like a, a, a discovery of our destiny. Every human being comes home when they meet Jesus. Jesus is not just a way, he is the way. He is the only way, and as soon as he touches our lives, it awakens something that nothing else can. I like the example of um, an old violin in the flea market, looking so useless and, and, and dirty, and no one even looks at it, it's valueless. But then someone like Yehudi Menuhin sees it and picks it up, tunes it, and begins to play. And suddenly that old piece of scrap wood that's worthless in everybody's eyes suddenly becomes in the master's hands. It becomes uh, part of a work of art from the mind of the master through his hands and expressed through all that that violin is capable of. And that is true of us. We only find our destiny. Every human being is like a piece of, of, of rubbish, really, on the waves of the sea until we are back in the master's hand. When we are in his hands, something comes alive in us. And uh, so Jesus is saying this is, this is the destiny. When the Father shows you and you see me, you're discovering the missing piece that is necessary for your life. That's why the whole of life, not we talk about Christian life, but we're talking about all life. Every human being has this missing element. And until they know him, and it's the father who reveals him. <clears throat> so um, then they said, verse 19, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And uh, it's wonderful to see this link between Jesus and the father, that the revelation of the father is bound to happen when we know Jesus. We cannot know Jesus without knowing the father in some measure. It's as if... Um, if, as if you could know someone like David Beckham, you could meet David Beckham and you could speak to him and maybe meet him on a plane and and uh, on the when you arrive at a certain place, somebody says, "Oh, you were sitting next to David Beckham. What did you you know what did you talk about?" And I could say, "Well, I talked about me." Then you know who David Beckham is. What does he do? Don't you know he's a footballer? And of course. David Beckham and football are synonymous. That's his whole life. And it's the same for Jesus, that he is, his whole life is the Father. If you spend time with Jesus and don't know the Father, then the question is, what's happening here? Because Jesus loves the Father. And it's his main passion and theme to please the Father. Later on, we, we'll see a verse. Uh, let me turn you to it. It's in chapter um, uh, 14 verse 31 he says but that the world may know that i love the father 
And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. And then he's speaking about the cross. He's saying that the world, he says that, um, he said that uh, the world may know that I love the Father. Why did he go to the cross? For us, yes, but above all, to do the Father's will. The center of everything for Jesus is the Father. I'm going to say also in that chapter, the Father is greater than I. How, how magnificent a statement and one to meditate long on. The Father greater than Jesus. Um, these words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, this is verse 21, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. And he's beginning to uh, unfold the whole question of sin. We're going to come to that in a moment. Um, but he mentions here to them specifically, and he's, he's speaking to the Jews who rejected him, you will die in your sin. And he puts that in the singular, this sin, this great sin of rejecting the light that comes from, the, from God through his word. They were rejecting Jesus Christ, and this is the great sin. Of course, it goes right back to the Garden of Eden, the, the beginning of all sin. Was it a terrible act of some criminality? Was it a terrible act of some uh, immorality? No, it was just this simple act of rejecting the rule of God and his word. Shift that, that sin, that original sin, that simple act of rebellion, quiet rebellion, saying, I want to be independent. I am my own boss. I am the one who decides. That sin is the sin we have, we, we, which will, is the, the very heart and center of it. You will die in your sin because they, their sin was you're rejecting me and you will die in that rejection. Uh, it will lead you to death. Uh, let's read on. Um, the Jew said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. He said, you are from beneath. I am from above. Back to this, this theme in John's gospel of the eagle, the flying eagle. I come from above. And this is the life of a person waiting on God. I come to this problem from above. If ever you deal with a church split and you suddenly see that people have, have sunk down to an earthly view where people squabble and divide and, and people's personalities become so important and difficult, but if we can come from above and see everything from God's perspective, whatever situation you're in, come from above. Come from the place of peace. I am from above. I'm waiting on God. I don't come from the panic and confusion of a life that's just drift on the waves of the sea and moved by the last wave and by the last situation. I'm not in a panic because of even big waves that come across the earth, like, like uh, pandemics and wars and economic problems. I'm, I'm coming from above. My life is rooted in eternity. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, plural now, for if you do not believe that I am, and that's the Greek, if you do not believe that 
I am. And he's, he's talking about now the sins that come from the sin. The, the rebellion and all the things that will flow from it. There's sin and there's sins. There's the very central heart of sin, the very nature and heart of what sin is. And there's sins that come from it. People's sins vary. But the fundamental root sin of the human race, the, that heart of sin must be changed. And that's common to us all. Um, you will die. In, if you do not believe that I am, am the key to being set free the key to uh, being um, removed from that world of, of condemnation and darkness is to believe who jesus is and this is why the first theme in this chapter is uh, the identity of jesus so um here we've got the beginning again of this, this introduction, this re-emphasis of the theme of the I am. Um, you see, the teaching of John is that it is of eternal importance to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah and God in human form. This is the, the teaching of the Bible. It's the the key thing, the, the key recognition from the heart to confess that Jesus is the Messiah. The refusal to recognize the manifold witness about Jesus denies a person access to salvation and all the great grace of God. Uh, of course, th those living in Israel in this day had no, had no grounds to reject him. They could see this witness on so many sides, but there, above all, him standing in front of them, the great I am. Let's just jump over to um, um, verse um, 58. Most assured, I say to you before, Abraham was I am. Let's just uh, fill that out a bit more. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, before Abraham came into existence, I am. Before the foundation of the world, I am. Uh, this huge statement, I am Jehovah. I am the one that appeared in the burning bush. And... Uh, there was no excuse for rejecting this marvelous pulsating center of the universe located in the person of Christ. And then in verse 25, then they said to him, who are you? Remember this, ver this question is asked by Pilate later on in chapter 19. Who are you? Where do you come from? This awareness that this person, and when you read these, these words in the Gospels, you're conscious. Jesus is so different, so authoritative, so pure, so loving, so perfect. There's something shining through. Jesus answered them and said, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. I'm taught of the Father. But they didn't understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man on a cross, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things, and he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed on him. Now, you've got the many verses here, but Jesus is stating his unity with the father. He's going to say that explicitly in chapter 10. I and the father are one uh, this perfect harmony 
with the Father that was absolute, unshakable. The, the serenity of Christ was his intimacy with the Father. We're talking now, he is God, but he's also in human form showing us how to live. He was secure in the Father's love. So what have we said so far about the identity of Christ? Let's just sum up what we've said. We have said that um, the Father is the one who is active to reveal, to point out the identity of the Son. That's the first thing we, we, we said. And that, that is the work of God, to point to Jesus Christ. The whole uh, ministry of the Spirit, the whole ministry of the Father is to cause everyone to fix their eyes on Jesus. The second thing is this knowledge of pre-existence and destiny. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. The third is the I am. I am. He repeats this several times in this verse that we've read. And of course, going to before Abraham was, I am. It's this central thing that Jesus is the great I am. The fourth thing is the knowledge that he would be crucified and that on the cross, his identity would be confirmed by all that he did there and all that he said there and the way that he died. When I am lifted up, you will know that I am. He said later on also that when he is lifted up, he will draw all humanity to himself. Jesus evidently knew that the key thing that would break through the ignorance and the veil that is on the human hearts was his cross. He knew that something would happen on the cross that would result in an explosion of revelation about him. And that explosion was the day of Pentecost. Um, and the, the final, the fifth thing that we see is Jesus's oneness with the Father, this perfect unity with the Father. So that's what we've said about the identity of Jesus Christ. We've said those five things about him, just summing them up. And then we turn now to the second great subject of this chapter, uh, which is the knowledge of, un of understanding what sin is, uh, the true nature of sin. So let's just move on. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. And we have to be very, um, what's the word, careful to understand to whom he is addressing words now. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. He said this. If you abide in my word. You are my disciples indeed. Now, just to notice there that this word disciples, if you think about uh, other passages of the Bible where it talks about discipleship, then you will know that uh, there are, uh, in Luke's gospel, if a man does not take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be his, my disciple and so on. All those big words on discipleship go into all the world and make disciples there in Matthew 28. In John's gospel, there are three words on discipleship that are very important. This is the first one. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's the first one. The second one is in chapter... 13 when he said uh, so shall you be my disciples if you love one another and the third one is in uh, john 15 when he said uh, if you abide in me uh, you shall bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples so you've got this truth of freedom we're going to see freedom from sin loving one another and bearing fruit. These are the three key things. And also, they're all about abiding in Christ. When we think of discipleship, 
remember that we are taught how to be a disciple by the master disciple. Jesus is himself a disciple. And John's gospel shows us a true disciple. There is no truer disciple than Jesus Christ, who is a disciple of the Father. The word disciple means a learner, a pupil, somebody in school. Uh, if, if I said to you, oh, I'm no, no longer a learner, I know the Bible now, I read it so many times, I, then I am no longer a disciple, that's what I'm saying. No, I must still cultivate the attitude of a learner. If I don't, I won't, I won't walk in the way Jesus walked. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. He basically said, I know nothing of myself. I live in constant dependence on another. And I notice this, that in, disciple, in discipleship, in the Gospels, they followed Jesus physically. But the handover comes when he departs, and they still followed him by the Spirit. And we have to be disciples of Jesus by the Spirit, taught of him, sitting at his feet, walking with him. We have to be his disciples. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And uh, this is a, uh, the, the passion of God, go into all the world and make disciples, teach all nations. And then he says, you shall know the truth. If you follow me and get to the place where you're taught by me, where you're relating to me, you're following me, you will know the truth. This, key steps here abide in my word be my disciples you shall know the truth and the truth will loosen and break the bonds of sin in your life the truth shall make you free the answer of these jews it's it's very Interesting here to notice that they are the Jews who believed in him. Maybe there's also a larger group. Some of them were a bit uh, not believing in him. But let's just assume we've got some of those believing, beginning to believe in him. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Now, um, this is such a, a, a monumental untruth what did they mean did they mean oh we've never been in bondage to any we've never been in captivity to any other what well, do you think which bible have you read what history book do you read the jews were in captivity um from 605 or 586 bc around that time they went there were two uh, the northern kingdom was 729 BC, the southern kingdom uh, 586. They were in captivity. First, the Assyrians there, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Judah, under the Babylonians. Then after the Babylonians, the Persians. After the Persians, the Greeks. After the Greeks, the Romans. And they were still in bondage. They were still not free as a nation. They'd had different degrees of it. Um, sometimes a bit more free, but they were occupied for the last 580, 600 over years, they'd been in bondage to another nation. So what do they mean? We've never been in bondage to anyone. Oh, well, yeah, they could have meant it spiritually, but then didn't they, didn't they read Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and all the prophets? warning them of their sins of idolatry and disobedience and the reason they had the captivities was because of their spiritual bondage to sin so uh, the whole witness of the old testament was 
You've walked in ways that displease me. You've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns which can hold no water. The, the whole thing is a witness against the, 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 the sin and the, the bondage of Israel that led to political bondage. What did they mean by that? How can you say they said you'll be made free? Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. But a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And of course, he's now talking about freedom from sin. And he says there are people who are, if you like, they want to be on the, on the, the edges of God's people. They want to be somehow linked in, identified with Christian morality, Christian standards, in some measure, but are not coming into the house as children, not letting the word of God transform them from being a slave of sin into a, a son. Now, let's just think about this a, a little bit more, because they're going to argue with him. It's going to bring something more out about sin. But let's just think about this. He, let's just think of this: these Jews who are arguing with, with uh, Jesus. They believe in him, but they're arguing. And they're pushing back. They're justifying themselves. They're trying to find some way of, of getting through this. Now, just compare this with Peter. You see, when Peter was was in the upper room in chapter uh, 13. Uh, Jesus w washed his feet and then he said, uh, Peter said, you won't w never wash my feet. He argued with him. But it wasn't argument of rebellion. It was the argument of saying, no, uh, you can't, you're my master, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And then Peter says, they wash me all over, wash me head, wash me head, everything I want. You see, Peter wasn't arguing with Jesus. He was in this position of total surrender. And you have in this chapter, this pushback. They haven't reached this point that Peter reached. Yes, wash me. Now, that word, wash me, Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. It's the same, similar thing. If you don't allow the cleansing power of Jesus to change you, what are you doing? You're rejecting his life, his person, his rule. Now, it may be that we take time, and of course we do, but the point is we are We've reached this abandonment of Peter. Yes, Lord, whatever it takes. I want it. I'm not arguing with you. And uh, then, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And you can see he's talking to a larger group now, so people, he's sifting their hearts with his word, but here's some who are trying to kill him, because my word has no place in you. And the word of God, he's not just talking about the word that he spoke, but the whole Bible. You're not, it hasn't really got room at the center of your heart. It's got room in your heads, and the Pharisees love the word. But they took it as some kind of, of badge of honor, not something to change their lives. I speak what I've seen with my father. You do what you have seen with your father. They, and, and there you have this, this discipling of the power of darkness. What, 
I, I am discipled by the Father in heaven. You're discipled by another Father, your Father, which is the Prince of Darkness. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our Father. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And you'll notice, he says in verse 37, I know you are Abraham's descendants, but if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And he's mentioned Abraham here. Uh, he's going to mention him uh, later on that he's greater than Abraham. And you have this, um, uh, th this, this truth. You are physically the descendants of Abraham, but not spiritually. That's, of course, the great uh, challenge that comes through this. Uh, we don't apply this to the Jews because we're not Jews. We have to apply it to ourselves that we must not just be physically Christians. I'm attached to a church. We must be spiritually descendants of Abraham, having the faith of Abraham. Now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. You being discipled by your father. And you're following him. They said to me, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And they claimed that uh, God was their father. And um, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Again, this pre-existence. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You hear the words, but you're not listening. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there is zero truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? Claim there of sinlessness. And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you do, are not of God. Now, these are perhaps some of the most shocking words about sin in the whole Bible. And we have to explore them a little bit more and ask ourselves, what does this mean? That when he said, you're of your father, the devil. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter two. He says this, verse one, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And uh, wonderful, isn't it? And we could tempted to read on. But this, 
go back. You see, there you've got the association. All sin is in some measure an association with the devil because that's his world. He's the, if you think of Neptune as the king of the sea, and <laughs> the devil is the king of darkness, the prince of darkness. His power is severely limited, but that's his element. And if we live in darkness and sin, we are in that element. It doesn't mean we are devil possessed. It does not mean we are Satan controlled. But you see, it's shocking, these words of Jesus, that you are of your father, the devil. Why? Because, why is that shocking? Because the devil is the very center and heart and epitome of evil. We pass through life and we have, we're faced with two paths. And everyone is paid, faced with these two paths. We are faced with the path of Christ and the path of the devil. The demands of Jesus are so radical that most people will naturally pause before surrendering to his person and his demands. And the idea that some would choose the devil is is monstrous to most readers and people say no they don't choose the devil but the words of jesus point to the inevitable consequences of our choices if we humble ourselves and receive christ as lord then we will become children of god if we follow the way of self and pride we will find ourselves in company with the prince of darkness himself And that's what he's saying. He's saying, of course, he's not saying this to his own disciples because they have chosen him. They are going into that path, that way of light, of being renewed, of, of the bonds of darkness being released. Grace has come to present us a way out of darkness so that we can be free so he's saying to them you are allowing thoughts to be begotten in you which are of the liar of the murderer of the prince of darkness and that's monstrous but it's the way that people will go if they reject christ <clears throat> what a tremendous um deep thought this is that what satan was trying to do in the garden of eden was putting a seed in the human heart remember jesus comes to put a seed in your heart everything's about seed each one of us is already the product of seed um, that's what every human being is the seed of our father and when he says you are Abraham's descendants. It's interesting that the word descendants is the Greek word seed. You are Abraham's seed. And back in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 3, it talks about this, this conflict between the prince of darkness and the, and the seed of the woman. It's seed, the battle of seed. And it's which seed we will receive. And uh, uh, it, 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 it says this, I will between, put, put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, the seed of Satan, and her seed, which is Christ. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, we don't major on this, but it's simply the company we keep. If we reject Christ, we will shut ourselves off from the light and go into the company of the prince of darkness. Let's move on. The Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And you can hear the, the voice of the devil speaking through them in their rebellion. You can see the lies coming through, the father of lies and also the murderer, 
because they took up stones to stone him. They tried to kill him, the murderer. But here you've got them saying, you're a Samaritan. I guess that would be like calling a, a Jew a, a Palestinian today. You are a Palestinian. You have a demon, they said. He said, I don't have a demon. But I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. If you receive the word of God, you shall pass from death to life. Remember that in chapter five. And you will never see death, which is separation from God. You will die physically, but physical death will just be a moment passing from one through one life to another. You'll never see death. You'll never see the separation from God. You'll never see that bleak, um, awful state of desolation an alienation from God. You won't see it that you'll be in fellowship with God forever. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. You see, here they, they are rejecting, they're pushing back. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? And they, they couldn't understand his word. He's not speaking of physical death. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word your father abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad now we don't know exactly what jesus was referring to there let's just think of some of the things it may have been well we know that abraham was visited by three men on one occasion and in those three was a revelation of God. And uh, he, Ab Abraham stood in awe before God and prayed and interceded. And God spoke wonderful things to him. He had that encounter with, with God on Mount Moriah. When he met God in that great act of sacrifice. We could point to other things where he had this this deep encounter. There were seven times in the life of Abraham when he had a deep encounter with God. But it may be that Jesus is saying, your father Abraham, in those events, looked beyond them to the coming of Messiah and saw my coming and saw the kingdom I would build, saw the cross and the resurrection. Certainly he had insights into that when he offered up his son Isaac in a picture, or was ready to offer up his son Isaac. He looked beyond everything, says Jesus. He saw my day, and he saw it and was glad. Again, the pre-existence of Jesus. The Jews said to him, you are not yet 50, and yet you have seen Abraham? Oh, Jesus said before Abraham was, before he was born. Before the foundation of the world, before there were planets, before there was a human race, before there were angels, before everything, I am. It's this huge claim. Jesus is the I am. And then they took up stones to stone the I am. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, passed by. And then he sees a blind man and puts mud on his eyes. And we're going to come to that in, in, on the 22nd of April when we, when we do our next one. 
but he put mud on him to again show them that the darkness was not out there in the world. The darkness is here over my eyes. And the blind man couldn't see, he had darkness and he had to be washed. We'll come to that because he's continuing. It's the same day, chapter nine. As chapter eight and nine are the same day. So we've got the understanding of sin, something I'm sure that we've only touched, uh, and I'm sure there's many questions left in people's hearts and minds, this association with the prince of darkness. And remember what we're saying, we're not saying that this is, that sin is demon possession or devil possession, we're saying this is a seed in us. It's a, a seed that will destroy us. It's a seed that will grow. It's a seed that will fight God. It's a seed that will, it's the seed of the enemy. It's the seed of darkness. And a person who is going to be like Peter and say, I don't care what it takes, take it out of me. I'm not going to re justify myself. I'm not going to argue with God. I want freedom from sin. I must wash you, said Jesus. And wash my head and my feet. There's no, there's no pushback. If there's a pushback in your life, it will be manifest in the fact that you, you don't want to be submitted to anyone. You don't want to any, any discipline of obedience. You don't want any constraint on your life. You want just to be your own self. This is the, the very heart of darkness is to be is independence walking your own way but this way i tell whatever it takes lord we come back to this great word and we'll finish with this if you abide in my word you are my disciples indeed another seed has come to you another word another kingdom and you shall know the truth. And the truth is, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the I am. He's the eternal God. He's God come to pick up our broken life like an old cast off violin and produce music. Take me in your hands and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And uh, verse 36, therefore, if the son makes you free, you're no longer a slave uh, trying to work somehow on the edges like the Pharisees who were religious, but not getting in the heart of it. You, know, you won't be like a slave like that. You'll be a son. The word will make you a son, you shall be free. If the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And the power of the, the son of God, this combination of this life, this eternal life, I am life, in us sets us free from sin. There is no other way of being set free from sin. The human will can't do it. Religion obviously can't do it. The only place of freedom from sin is being a true disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, surrendering entirely to him and letting him teach us and lead us and empower and change us. And we shall be free indeed. We are free indeed by his grace. We sit here this morning free indeed. And if you haven't abandoned entirely to Jesus Christ to be your, your, your master, your Lord, and to make you his disciple and set you free, then do it this day. Go alone and say, like Peter said, whatever it takes, Lord, I want everything. I want to be clean. I want to be, I want to be right in that will. I want, I'm not fighting you, Lord. I'm not trying to justify myself. I want this place. I don't want any association with the Prince of Darkness. Let me pray with you then, Will. 
Jesus Christ, you are wonderful. I acknowledge you. I confess you with my lips and with my heart. Believe it in my heart. You are the Messiah. You are the creator. You are the I am. You are immeasurable, unchanging. You are deep beyond all measure. You are you're great in love, in grace. Jesus, you are amazing. And I am glad to be in this place this morning, wanting to be as abandoned to you and surrendered to you as it is possible to be. I give you my whole life, Jesus. I want to be your disciple indeed and free indeed. And free to know you, free to walk with you, free to rejoice and live in God's free air of the Spirit. Praise your wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. And do this for everyone. If there's anyone hearing these words who has not yet surrendered entirely, Lord, bring about that entire surrender. Help us to it. Help us keep in that place. And thank you that there's a place where our life changes and we are set free. You make us free. Praise you for the power of birth from above. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.